good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International. Okay, you can't. Is this working? Yeah. <laughs> May I have your attention, please? We are starting the meeting. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Wilson Center. I'm Hale Svandiari, and uh, the director of the Middle East program. Today's meeting, Arab Spring or Arab Autumn, Women's Political Participation in the Arab Uprising and Beyond, is uh, co-sponsored with CARE and the Wilson Center's Global Women's Leadership Initiative. I urge you, when you leave the meeting, before you go to the reception, take the reports that are outside. Uh, CARE has put out a number of reports, so has the Department of State. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars was established in uh, 1968, we are a nonpartisan center which aims to unite the world of ideas the, with the world of policy by supporting preeminent scholarship and linking that scholarship to issues of concern to officials in Washington. Uh, Congress established the center as the official national memorial to President Wilson. So as you see, it's a living memorial, uh, and we constantly have uh, meetings and uh, um, conferences here. The, as I said earlier, we are a nonpartisan institution, and for our meetings, we invite a diverse group of sp speakers and uh, pre present a variety of views. This morning we had uh, a meeting on Egypt and uh, we discussed where uh, Egypt is uh, heading to. The Middle East program began in 1998 and in addition to spotlighting the day-to-day -day issues, uh, it continues to concentrate on long-term regional development as long term as you can call anything in the Middle East, you know. Um, but um, so we try and project uh, what might happen in five years or ten years, and quite often we don't predict the right thing. Like none of us predicted the the Arab Spring and <laughs> the departure and demise of leaders of a number of countries in that. Uh, region. Uh, on the average, we host every year around uh, 60 meetings, and since its inception, the Middle East program has convened 131 meetings on gender issues alone. So we, we were among the first institutions in Washington that started convening uh, meetings on women's rights in the MENA region. Um, our partner today, uh, CARE, was founded in 1945 and with the creation, of course, of CARE Package. Uh, CARE is a leading humanitarian organization fighting global poverty and it places special focus on working alongside poor girls and women because equipped with the proper resources, they have the power to lift whole families and entire communities out of poverty. Last year, CARE worked in 84 countries and directly reached to 83 million people around the world. Our other partner today and co-sponsor is the Global Women's Leadership Initiative Global Network is the platform for the Women in Public Service Project, WPSP, and uh, Stephanie, you have been a big help, I'm told, to the WPSP program, so special welcome to you. And, we, and uh, uh, the WPSP was based in the Department of State. It moved to 
the Wilson Center in 2012. It has a global presence with over 80 affiliations, including government entities, academic institutions, and multilaterals. Uh, a colleague, of my colleague Rangita de Silva de Alvis, is the director of the GWI and WPSB, but she is traveling today and could not be with us. But her other colleagues are uh, in the audience. Um, let me now turn to our speakers. I will introduce them and will call on each of our speakers to speak uh, 15 minutes, and I will ask them the first couple of questions, and then we will open the floor to your questions and comment. Uh, our uh, first speaker is going to be Shirin Ibrahim. I'm sorry I use the Persian pronunciation. I say Shirin, <laughs> it's Shirin <laughs> Ibrahim. She has been working in the field of development for the last 17 years, starting her work as a researcher on sexual and reproductive health rights in Egypt. Since then, she has worked extensively in Egypt, South Asia, the United States, and the Middle East. And over the course of the last eight years, uh, Sherin has held senior regional management positions in the Middle East and Asia for Save the Children UK, Oxfam America, and more recently with CARE uh, USA. Uh, I'm going to give you the short bios. We have distributed the longer version. I'm sure you have them. Our second speaker is Maryam Jamshidi. I don't have to worry for pronunciation of your name. She's a lawyer and writer with nearly 10 years of experience uh, working on issues relating to the Middle East and North Africa. Mariam's writing has have appeared in various academic publications as well as in media outlets such as Al Jazeera, English, and Truth Out. She's also the founder of Mukhtar.org, uh, which is a digital magazine uh, focusing on domestic and international issues. She's the author of a very interesting book, The Future of the Arab Spring, Civic Entrepreneurship in Politics, Art, and Technology Startups. And our uh, third speaker is Stephanie Foster, who has over 25 years of experience in policy advocacy, government affairs, program development, and training and law with a focus on the critical role that women play in advancing public policy and development. Uh, prior to joining the Department of State's Office of Global Women's Issues as a senior policy advisor, she served at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, focusing on women and civil society. Uh, she has also participated in numerous international programs and projects sponsored by the State Department, Vital Voices, NDI, and IFES. And she previously served as Chief of Staff to two U.S. Senators, Barbara Mikulski, who is a senator from my state, <laughs> and Christopher Dodd. Um, and she held senior positions at Legacy and Planned Parenthood and was appointed by President Clinton as General Counsel for the General Services Administration. Um, since the beginning of the Arab Spring, uh, we have uh, hosted uh, 10 meetings with women in the region to see how they think women have fared um, and whether the Arab Spring has opened up new opportunities. If I summarize what we were told, it was in these three words, euphoria first, disappointment second, and now fighting back. Mm -hmm. To see whether this is the case, I turn now to our panelists. Shirin, you have the mm. <laughs> Thank you. Mic. I think this is working. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halle. And I'm sorry if I'm not uh, pronouncing uh, 
your name yeah. correctly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a special thank you to the Wilson Center and to our guests uh, today. My name is Shireen, and uh, as Dr. Hala kindly uh, introduced me, I am a part of the CARE family. I work in the Middle East uh, and North Africa region as part of the Regional Management Unit. And I had the honor very recently of working with a team of fabulous men and women from across our region to, um, to develop and to write up the report that we're sharing today with the audience, which is entitled Arab Spring or Arab Autumn, Women's Political Participation in the Uprisings and Beyond, and some implications for international donor policy. But I'd like to start really with the, wor the first word that Dr. Uh, Hala just talked about, which is the state of euphoria that all of us experienced uh, three years ago. And I'll start with a quote that we start the report with, uh, which was uh, said to us by one of the young women activists who we spoke to from Yemen uh, at the start of this research piece. And she said to us, um, to join the protests on Friday mornings and pray al Juma with other women. I had to take shortcut routes by walking through rugged mountains every Thursday night. After what I had done, no force on earth dared to neglect me. I think this was really, I just wanted to bring back into the room the sense of excitement and the hope and the possibilities that we felt as young men and women who were part Oh, he who felt that we were part of the change process in our respective countries. And of course, today, yes, we have gone through you know, some disappointment, but it is very important for us to maintain that we are, of course, fighting back. But part of the, the, what I'd like to present today are some of the challenges that we face as activists and as members of the women's movement, but also as international civil society organizations and national civil society organizations in ensuring that the space and the scope for women's voice in policy processes is, uh, is, uh, is afforded to us. And so I unfortunately, uh, sort of as I pull together my notes, I, I focused on some challenges because it also helps us talk about some of the opportunities. Um, let me just say that um, I just wanted to start by giving you a sense of what the situation looks like now for women in the Middle East region. Many of you may have read the uh, World Economic Forum uh, gender, gap, uh, the, the uh, gender Gap Report for 2013 and 2012. You may know that the Middle East now sits at, at the bottom of the ranking when it comes to women's economic and political participation, which, uh, which may come as a surprise to, to some and not as a, as, a, as a surprise to many. But I just also wanted to start with, uh, with sharing of some of the statistics. Um, in Egypt, in 2012, in the 2012 parliament, we had the, one of the lowest uh, percentages, uh, percentages globally for women's representation in parliament, and that was 2%. Um, in, uh, in the Middle East, in general, representation of women in our parliaments is just under 13%. If we were to look at Yemen, there are only three women uh, who hold ministerial posts out of a total of 35. If we to are to look at Palestinian uh, the Palestinian Authority's Legislative Council, there are 17 women out of 132 men. And so really there is something, e and this, these are recent statistics, these are as of 2012. So let us not just say, of course, that the uprisings sort of have changed things for women. This is, there has been a buildup in terms of the compromise of the space in which women uh, are allowed and are afforded a uh, place uh, where decisions are made that affect their lives and the lives of their families. So I just wanted to give you a sense of what the Middle East and North Africa looks like. Again, just to re-emphasize, ranking lowest in terms of um, economic participation and political empowerment. Eight of the, the 10 lowest performing countries on labor force participation. And four out of the countries in our region have absolutely no representation of women in their parliaments. So just a sense of, of where we are. And why is this important for us now? And why, for me, is this the most critical moment uh, or a critical time? I think there are two things that come to mind. The first is that while there was an incredible spotlight on issues of social justice and gender justice 
with the uh, popular uprisings that took place in our region, the spotlight is, has moved away from issues of uh, women's, uh, um, from women's issues in general. The spotlight is now on, the, on aspects of safety, security, counterterrorism, but m gradually we are hearing less and less about the basic and fundamental reasons why many of us were out on the streets calling for so social and gender justice. So my big concern um, is that the spotlight has shifted away and we are struggling to maintain a spotlight on these issues of social and gender justice. The second and the reason why I'll sort of uh, speak a little bit more about a concer the concern that I have is that as we spoke to young women and women and we did this research, we, there was a greater sense that there was an incredible amount of fragmentation within uh, uh, and amongst those who were concerned with uh, women's rights in our region and women's political and economic and social participation. And I'll speak to what it is I heard, but also my own sense and my own experience in, 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 uh, in this inability uh, to coalesce around and to come together once again to really put forward a strong voice and to make the case for why women need to be participating in policy spaces and in spaces where their voices can be heard. The first is that there is an incredible amount of fragmentation and competition between the activists, the actors, the groups, and the more established entities within our region. And this competition has continued and is continuing. And there have been some, but not enough, attempts to bring back that unified uh, voice to focus the spotlight on on women's um, uh, rights and women's right to be in policy spaces where they matter. So where are the divisions? The divisions are geographic, so rural, urban. The divisions are generational, older and new, the older being termed elite institutions and individuals. Ideological divides that are growing by the day and by the hour. And really what is problematic about all this is that when you do ask the different groups about what it is they'd like to see in terms of advancements in women's political participation rights, it's very difficult to get a clear articulation of the agenda. So that is the, so the division and the competition and the fragmentation is one of the big challenges. If we want to bring back the spotlight, it is somewhat problematic. I had a young woman again from Yemen say to me, the established women's movement is not renewed. There is a challenge for the old and traditional section of the women's movement to, you, to reach younger activists. And there, in, the, in her statement, I felt that there even was difficulty in dialogue, in, in coming to a place where we can dialogue about what it is we would like to achieve together, which is extremely problematic if you can't don't, if, and if, you, if you're unable to find the opportunity and the common ground to dialogue around, the, around what it is we want to achieve collectively. Another challenge for us is that, and as, this is a, as we heard it, that some of the more established institutions like the Women's Rights Councils and the, women's, the National Council for Women in Egypt and others, some of these councils um, that were entrusted and mandated to navigate between government and civil society there was almost a sort of a, a fear and an anxiety about their own agenda moving forward. And that many felt that they had either been co-opted by the state or that they either wanted to dominate these new young activist groups, which is problematic because in these institutions, there is the experience and the history that is required for us to advance the, 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 the rights agenda. A third um, challenge that we're facing as sort of a, a, a groups and of women's rights uh, of, of women's rights activists and, and groups is that um, we're sort of we're we're being all we're also being looked at uh, and I'll use the term that was used by a Islamic woman's activist when she said to me, uh, you know, some of some of you are acting like intoler intolerant liberals. You are yourselves showing and demonstrating a level of intolerance 
to our own interpretations of women's rights from an, from a, a, an Islamic perspective. And that's not helping us to come to a place where we can advance an agenda. So it, has also, it also invites us to think about what it is that we are not doing to bring, uh, to, to bring, our, our, uh, to bring a sort of a more, uh, to, come to, a common, uh, to common, come to a common and more unified uh, ground. And, I, and there are a couple more challenges that, I, that I'd like to speak to. Uh, a lot of those young activists who we spoke to said, you know, this over-reliance on technology and this wonderful sort of rely initial reliance on technology has not served us. And I know that we will be hearing, you know, a little more and per perhaps some questions uh, around this issue because, you know, Facebook and Twitter and other uh, channels were used quite extensively at the start of these uprisings. There was a reliance on technology to mobilize people and to have people sort of... Uh, um, engage in street-based activism. But what has happened is that it's also alienated those very people that we need to be listening to and hearing from, because not all of our populations in the Middle East are connected to the Internet. And so that even if we were to reach a common place and a common agenda and a place where we can sort of express our, our concerns around women's uh, the, the restrictions and, uh, on women's rights particip and w women's participation, we have not been able to use technology to really facilitate that engagement, to be more proactive in ensuring that women have a sense of what their collective identity and their collective actions and their, and, and their proposals moving forward. So in, in a sense also people have asked us, you know, whether, we, whether our celebration of technology is... is, is um, is uh, a celebration that we, we need to continue to have and whether there are other ways that we can uh, think about engaging those who have now found themselves unable to come in to the conversation around what needs to be done. So I just wanted to put to, uh, to us as a, as a, as, as a, as, you know, as, as, as members and, and people concerned about this issue is that it's not just that the spotlight has been taken away because the powers that be would like to talk about safety and security and how to, how to manage, uh, you know, um, uh, terrorism in our, in our countries. But th the fact is that we are also not w helping each other to bring back the spotlight. And this fragmentation is probably the most, at this point in time, is probably the most detrimental uh, um, uh, problem to the uh, to what I think is 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 a, is is, um, is a huge challenge for the Middle East and for women in the Middle East um, and North Africa especially. So uh, part and, and I invite you to re to read the report, but we also make a couple of recommendations as to what it is that we need to do. Some recommendations are program uh, uh, very very program focused, and others are policy focused. So I'll just. I'll just, if you'll allow me, and if I have a few more minutes, more minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'd like to, to, uh, to uh, talk um, about them a little bit more. The first is I think that we, you know, we, we really want to make sure that those more established institutions and organizations and those, those more experienced um, uh, actors in the women's movement, men and women, uh, actually, uh, are able to reach those young activists and to hear their voices. The bridging of that divide and facilitating those conversations where, uh, uh, where, they, where, where we can find common ground is critical. And if there's anything that we need to do moving forward is to bridge that divide. There's a lot of anxiety and fear and division. And so programmatically, CARE and other organizations that I know are working in the Middle East are really working uh, and looking at ways in which we can really come to a common place and com have those conversations, difficult as they may be, have those conversations around, um, around what the women's rights agenda and what it will take for us to increase representation and voice of women in policy spaces. Uh, I think that there's also a, a need for us to focus a little bit more on, on really being a little more flexible as international NGOs and national entities in working with uh, with young men and women, the young men and women of our region have 
as, as Dr. Halla said, you know, have, are, are somewhat in a, in a state of disappointment. And part of the disappointment is not just the politics and the political dynamic. It's also the fact that they haven't been able to translate, many of them haven't been able to translate that energy and excitement and euphoria and channel it to, uh, to a place where they feel they're making a difference. And so it feels like the same old cycle of helplessness uh, in, in bringing about uh, uh, change. So really, how uh, working with young men and women to sort of channel those energies and, um, and to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, we're, we're also looking at, um, through our programs, really trying to bridge the, and I hate, I, I, I'm going to use these, divide, uh, this, these words, but I know we'll get a lot of questions around them. I'm going to say that we're going to need to also have to um, bridge the religious secular divide. That ex and I know I'll get a lot of heat for using those words, and I am sorry. That's a very loose, those are very loose uh, and very problematic terms to use. But, but our religion, uh, our, our countries and the Middle East is, you know, is growing in, 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 its, uh, in its conservative tendencies. But there are also some very interesting and progressive attempts to try to reinterpret some of our sort of our um, the sort of the religious uh, basis upon which many of us have grown up and to in reinterpret them and align them with some of the more progressive uh, statements and understandings um, related to women's rights so I don't want to sort of call out uh, particular organizations but I'm sure many of you have have heard of Musawa and many of uh, much of what Musawa is doing is really trying to bridge that religious uh, secular divide and reinterpret um, um, Islam. Um, uh, uh, finally, I think that a lot of what we heard in terms of um, programmatic work that helps support women's uh, groups and women's organizations is to really help in the networking and linkages between young men and women, because there are lessons to be learned across the region around how to open up spaces for women's engagement. And you know, Tunisia is always cited as the example in which the you know there is there are, there's progress being made in that regard. And many of those we spoke to said, well, let's learn from the positive experiences, not just from within our region, but <coughs> from outside of our region. Um, I, won't, I won't go on for too long, but what I'd really like to say is that um, there are really there are also some policy recommendations that we're trying to make to this report. And one of them, the, the most important one uh, for us, is that we, we need to help foster the conditions where civil society can thrive, can really can thrive. It's, we are, I mean, if I were to think about what's happening in Egypt today, if we're continually continually silencing the voices of dissent in our region and doing it by restricting the space for all of civil society to be proactive and engaged and holding our governments accountable, we really do have quite a problem. So one of our main recommendations is that we, we'd like um, to see more support to, uh, to those governments and especially donor governments uh, when it comes to fostering the conditions where civil society can thrive. We would like to ensure that, um, again, we, their sort of donor governments especially, take a more balanced approach. Uh, yes, we understand the geopolitical importance of our region, but, you know, um, you know, safety and security can be balanced with democracy, human rights, and social justice. And so let's not, let's not sort of compromise one at the expense of the other. I think there's a lot that can be done in nation building processes and seizing on opportunities like constitutional development processes or national dialogues like that like those that are taking place in Yemen to say that their women must have a voice those governments that are supporting constitutional development processes or national dialogue in Yemen need to ensure that women are represented and you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will ask me, well, how, how is that? The fact of the matter is, you know, when you have a sort of a mutual accountability frameworks like the one that exists for Yemen or the EU more for more framework, donor countries can and should be able to 
to re to emphasize the need for greater voice and participation wo of women in these uh, processes. And finally, one last thing that we heard from young men and women was the issue of accountability. And many of them said to us, "You know, you will not, we will not be able to uh, to fully and adequately represent be represented, and our voice will not be heard if we don't." emphasize the accountability agenda. If donor governments are channeling money into countries, into the Middle East, we want to be consulted. We want to ensure that adequate benchmarks are put in place so that the, um, recipient governments are held, held accountable and we can ask them questions around where they have made advancements when it comes to the women's rights agenda and especially where women uh, where, where women's voices are heard. So just to close on that note and say, you know, I, um, we are being asked to be, to hold not just our national governments accountable using the resources that flow into our country, but donor governments as well are expected to demonstrate greater accountability because otherwise um, we're not going to be able to advance as, as fast as we would like to when it comes to inclusive uh, and more uh, greater representation of women in policy processes and spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Maria, you have. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center and Dr. Esfandiari for uh, convening this important discussion um, and for including me uh, in the dialogue. So first of all, thank you for that. Second of all, um, I'm about to push back a little bit on some of what Shireen said. So. Buckle up, everybody. Um, I am going to be talking about uh, the concept of civic entrepreneurship uh, generally. I'll, I'll start out with the concept itself um, and talk about it a little bit vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the revolutions. Um, I'll move on to discuss uh, how activism uh, differed before and after the revolutions very generally and uh, the role of civic entrepreneurship entrepreneurship in that shift. Uh, I'll then move on to talk about women's participation again pretty generally in the Arab Spring and end with some insights and recommendations. So uh, one of the most common uh, questions that we often hear, especially in the West, about the Arab Spring is whether or not what has been happening inside the region uh, constitutes a revolution. And if these are revolutions, whether or not they've succeeded, and oftentimes the answer to that question depends upon how people understand the concept of revolution itself. So most commonly, rev re revolution is understood as um, a massive change that re replaces one form of government with another. It's by and large considered to be a, a positive shift, so societies go from being worse off to better off, and uh, it's oftentimes very linear and fairly quick in terms of its progress, pretty black and white. Now, obviously, this is not what's been happening inside the Arab world. So does that mean that there hasn't been a revolution or if there has been that they haven't succeeded? Um, well, I would say that there, ha there have indeed been, been revolutions and that their outcomes remain unclear. And that's largely because the transformations that are required in order for revolutions to truly take hold don't simply involve shifts in the political structures of a country. but go much deeper. They affect how individuals understand their relationships with their governments, with other people in their societies. They impact how uh, social norms and cultural norms get articulated. They even affect how people do business. And these are the, the transformations that have been happening, in my view, inside the Arab world since the revolutions began three years ago. And civic entrepreneurship is the way in which these transformations have happened. Th what civic entrepreneurship is, is essentially any citizen-driven uh, effort to mobilize communities to take advantage of opportunities and crises to help further the public good. And they, this, sort of, this concept uh, embraces a range of different kinds of initiatives, from political protest movements to uh, social movements to volunteer organizations, youth organizations, artistic, musical, and theatrical collectives, and for our purposes, women's groups. 
uh, these efforts are by and large a very creative, very innovative, and quite surprising. Uh, the activist and anthropologist David Graeber talks a bit about revolutionary moments, and he describes them as followed by an outpouring of social, intellectual, and artistic creativity. Everyone feels not only the right, but usually the immediate practical need to recreate and reimagine everything around them. So uh, one of the most important things that civic entrepreneurship helps, uh, helps to do, and one of the ways in which it contributes to revolutions, is that uh, it creates a public, or helps create and b both create and sustain the public arena. And this is one of the key differences in terms of activism before and after the Arab Spring. Before the Arab Spring, public spheres did exist um, by and large throughout the Arab world. I should also mention that most of what I'm going to say um, is driven by the uh, experiences of the six countries at the forefront of the, of the Arab Spring, Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, Syria, and Bahrain. Um, that being said, uh, there are some countries within that group that are more conservative than others, and some countries that had no public sphere whatsoever before the Arab Spring. But quite a few did. They were quite limited and quite circumscribed. Where they were allowed to exist, the state often exerted control, not always predictably, but the state controlled the public sphere um, when it felt the need to. Uh, and so what's been interesting since the Arab Spring started is that that public, that public arena has not only uh, eliminated the influence of the, gov of the government to a large extent, but has also become an extremely powerful force. It is the place where individuals come together to speak and act in concert, as Hannah Arendt, who is a political theorist uh, who, who worked primarily uh, in the mid-20th century, spoke uh, about it's, it's the place where political power is generated. And so it's where people and governments interact with one another. It is just as important to democracy as elections, and it is one of the key elements to saving off authoritarianism. Another really important difference um, in terms of activism before and after the Arab Spring is the collaborative nature of initiatives and of individual acti uh, group activism since the Arab Spring started. And here, I disagree a little bit uh, with you, because there has been quite a bit of collaboration, um, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, to uh, socio across socioeconomic barriers, um, as well as in terms of um, the collaboration between old and new actors, so young activists who didn't necessarily have experiences with activism before, coupling and working with people who had revolutionaries who had uh, a larger track history, a more significant track, track history of, of activism. You also saw the diaspora working quite a bit with people inside the country as well. So there's a lot of collaboration going on, as well as collaboration between sectors, artists working with activists, working with technologists. And finally, it, it's been a very dynamic process. So a lot of these these groups very much respond to local or national needs, and they shift their work based upon what the needs on the ground are at the time. So in terms of uh, how civic entrepreneurship has sort of uh, been important in the, in the political sense, it's, as I mentioned, helped to maintain the public sphere, get, given regular individuals uh, an opportunity to contribute to the collective good. It's where the public sphere has remained disobedient, and it hasn't always remained disobedient, as we've been seeing in Egypt recently. It also helps maintain diffusions of power, which is which is very important to any democracy. So where governments, where a government basically has all the power in its hand, obviously democracy can't flourish. What the public arena helps do is through the, the collective popular power, it acts as a check and a balance against the government. It's also expanded, this concept of civic entrepreneurship has expanded what we think of as civil society. So it's not just NGOs anymore. It's a lot of different uh, types of groups. And frankly, at the end of the day, and I think this is probably going forward, what the um, biggest contribution will be from civic entrepreneurship in terms of uh, helping build uh, stronger political systems in these countries is that they're providing on-the-job training to future leaders. This is where young people are learning what it means to mobilize, or learning what it means to collaborate and cooperate. This is where they're gaining those skills. So very quickly, um, women's participation in the Arab Spring. So the Arab Spring is not, the, is not a black box. It occurred in a region that has a very long history and a very long history of 
women's rights movements. And so to speak very briefly about that, and again, it's I don't want to generalize, so to take all of this with a grain of salt, it's not true for every country, but by and large, uh, before the Arab Spring, women did have a public presence uh, across the Arab world. Uh, and the, the restrictions that they experienced were in many ways similar to the restrictions that men experienced in, in, in terms of political participation, but at the same time, it was also very different. Um, one of the best examples, I think, for understanding how uh, men and women worked in a similar capacity and together was through the is by looking at the national movements that happened in colonized Arab countries um, during the earlier parts of the 20th century. Women were a really important part of those national movements, and Egypt is probably the best example. Egyptian women were a critical part of those national movements. Of course, or not of course, but unfortunately, they made the strategic decision of putting women's rights behind as, or second to the uh, liberation of their countries. But they were nevertheless very, very important. Uh, once the colonizers were removed and indigenous governments uh, came to power, women unfortunately saw, uh, unfortunately, women were not rewarded for their participation in these movements. Um, however, they did make significant gains compared to where they were before. Secondary and high, levels of secondary and higher education increased tr tremendously. Their labor force participation also increased, relatively speaking. It's still uh, a, lot, uh, a lot less deep when compared to men's labor force participation. Um, at this point, um, every country in the Arab, in the Arab, well, in the Middle East, um, gives women the right to vote. Uh, with the exception of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, UAE where no one can vote. And um, and so things did get better. Um, but patriarchy remained strong. Um, uh, these societies remain patriarchal societies. And women were very much, women as a group were very much connected to the political system in the sense that national honor and family honor were very connected uh, in the sort of 1950s onward. And family honor was very connected to women's sexuality. So women's behaviors were very important to how nations actually uh, thought about themselves. Now, since the Arab Spring has started, women, I think we all know, have been very involved, very involved in the protest movements, um, very involved in setting up these various organizations and groups that I talked about. S quite a few of these groups do not have a very specific gender focus, but some of them do. Um, so women have found themselves advocating both more broadly for social justice issues as well as connecting women's issues to those social justice issues. And we can, I can talk a little bit more about that um, perhaps during the question and answer period. So a couple of insights um, and recommendations. So women occupy a very unique position in the region as political, as the political football of par excellence. Their presence in the political sphere is absolutely more charged than, than men's, pr men's presence in the political sphere, and that has uh, both benefits and challenges. The challenges are that when women enter the public sphere, we've seen this over and over again from Egypt to Libya, um, to Yemen, to Bahrain, um, they oftentimes are met with physical violence. Uh, violence against women has become a way of opposing the revolutions themselves. And again, we can get a little bit more into this later. At the same time, because women's honor and national honor are connected, this is anecdotal, but there are also often times where women are not um, targeted to the, extent, the same extent that men are, particularly when it comes to actual uh, legal uh, cases that are brought against men. So for example, in Egypt recently, um, uh, quite a few uh, very prominent male activists were arrested, whereas their female counterparts were given sus suspended sentences. And the belief is that their uh, presence, as uh, their role as, with their sim sorry, uh, their symbol as women and as women of a so certain socioeconomic class had a big part to play in that. Um, second, I think it's important to balance, insti balance institu institutionalization with innovation. So civic entrepreneurship, which promotes a real radical restructuring of social imaginations, is, as David Graeber observed, one of the hardest forms of action to institutionalize. So while we might want to give these various movements and groups uh, rigid, a rigid hierarchy, a established uh, mandate, uh, predictable financing, this has both benefits and weaknesses. On the one hand, it helps them endure. On the other hand, it makes them slightly less, less flexible in terms of actually responding to local needs. Uh, 
the the third recommendation would be to actually set these benchmarks, whatever the benchmarks are in in terms of understanding women's progress in the region, based on what women themselves feel that they need. So what's really important is that uh, the women on the ground are, are a part of the process of determining how we understand and assess women's rights in these countries. And again, I think we can talk a little bit more about, about, more about that later. Um, and then embedding women's rights in broader calls for social justice. Again, this is happening in the region and must continue. And finally, it is not women's rights that are key to the Arab Spring, but rather the Arab Spring that is key to women's rights. Organizations, particularly international ones, that work on women's rights in the Arab world would do best to ensure their efforts aim at ensuring broad political, social, and economic progress in, the, in regional countries in order to ensure that women's rights are also embedded in these societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Stephanie. Hello. Does this, okay, great. Uh, well, thank you all for coming today. I'm glad there's such interest in this topic. Thank you, of course, to the Wilson Center and CARE for the report and for uh, hosting us here today to talk about this important issue. Um, I want to talk a little bit first about what the Office of Global Women's Issues does at the State Department. Um, I want to start also by saying that these kind of forums, the reports that CARE is doing, uh, the kind of conversations that are hosted here are so important to the work we do because at the Global Women's Issues Office, uh, our job is internally at the State Department and externally to shine a spotlight, as you're saying, on the issues that women face around the world. And it's a big, it's a big world and a big mandate to really be looking at the interrelated and interconnected challenges that we face as women uh, across the globe, whether that is in economic empowerment, uh, building a sustainable peace and security uh, and secure state, uh, political participation, which is what we're talking about here, fighting gender-based violence and protecting women in conflict. These issues are all interrelated, and they, they all uh, go together every day for women around the world. Uh, they also are what we do at the State Department. Uh, we focus on those really uh, critical issues of political and economic empowerment, uh, engaging women in the peace process, fighting gender-based violence and other forms of, of violence against women, and also looking at how uh, we can sort of build the next generation of girls uh, to have a better future. So looking at issues around education and health uh, and how to combat uh, practices like child marriage. But really that's our job, uh, is to take those issues across the globe and really be able to do two things. One is to work internally within the State Department and our, our uh, uh, foreign policy uh, apparatus to raise those issues to our colleagues and to ensure that to the best of our ability that we are actually advocates for women uh, in the foreign policy world uh, in which the State Department uh, plays a large part. And then secondly, externally, really listening, uh, visiting, uh, talking to women and men across the globe about the issues that are faced and understanding that uh, we need to hear from people about what is happening to them in their lives, to hear from women uh, about the issues that are important to them every day. So uh, that is, I think, why these kind of forums, again, are so important. And hearing from uh, panelists and the, the people who you interviewed for the report and from people across the globe really help us to do our job better. So in, in terms of uh, women's political participation, um, I want to start by saying we clearly think this is a very important goal around the world, uh, everywhere, that women's political participation is one of the key building blocks to building a stronger you know, country for everyone, uh, to economic empowerment, to building uh, safe and secure uh, spaces, and to uh, fighting gender-based violence and building a better uh, social and economic system. We work a lot in those areas, clearly through programming, uh, that's done by USAID uh, to some large extent and the State Department. And we can talk a little bit more about that uh, maybe in the questions. I know many of you in this room are very familiar with the programming we do. We do it across the globe. We do a lot of it in uh, the countries in which we're talking about today, particularly to work with women civic organizations, to work with women who want to participate in the political and public spheres, to work with journalists to help them uh, be able to report on the issues that they face, uh, working with uh, trade union movements. So we, we do a lot of programming throughout the USAID and State Department mechanisms 
uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, all of those mechanisms to actually support the kind of uh, topics that we're talking about today. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, specifically to uh, the work that we do at uh, the Global Women's Issues Office. And one of the most interesting things I think that we do is really try to work to, as I said, to embed this kind of thinking in the work we do around foreign policy and conflict prevention and peace building. I left some copies of the National Action Plan for Women, Peace, and Security out at the desk. I think they're mostly gone, but they are available online. And the reason this is an important document, um, it comes out of the UN uh, framework about really trying to embed women in the peace and development process, is looking at political participation as part of how we establish and develop really stronger societies so that we can both prevent conflict and when we have conflict that we can mitigate it, uh, negotiate, resolve it, and move forward. So I think the NAP is a really good um, roadmap for us in the U.S. government, throughout the government, whether it's the State Department, USAID, the Defense Department, other parts of, of the government also are part of this process to really look at how we can uh, institutionalize our, our, our understanding of the importance of women um, in, in general, institutionalize the, our understanding of how women in decision-making positions, political participation uh, is so important. And that is not just in terms of women as negotiators to peace agreements, which there are very few we know, but also women as decision makers in the political sphere, women uh, encouraging women's participation at every level of, of political participation so that uh, as decisions are being made, the issues that women raise uh, are being brought to that decision making forum. We know that women often raise issues that uh, others don't or at least prioritize them differently. We know they represent constituencies sometimes that others don't. And we know uh, that they are able to bring date sort of knowledge from their daily lives to uh, the political decision-making process. So we think that's a very critical thing that the National Action Plan reminds us every day. Uh, we also, it clearly also deals with some issues that have been touched on today in terms of protecting women uh, from violence, uh, gender-based violence, violence in conflict. We know that uh, from reporting that we get that these issues are largely, they're very big around the world and they're big in this region. Um, and we also talk a lot about how to make sure that as conflicts are, are you know, uh, ongoing that women have access to relief and recovery in an appropriate way. But really, I bring this up to say that we work on these issues in a, in a very, I think, um, holistic way, understanding political participation as part of a larger set of issues that are important to women and important to moving societies forward. Uh, so it's, it's really with that that um, I'm so interested in the conversation because I feel there's so much to learn from um, what goes on in, in specific instances, but to always continue to use our ability to shine a spotlight on what is happening with women uh, to continue to bring those issues to the fore so that as uh, perhaps the media attention is, is less, uh, that we can use the power of our office to, to try to do some of that. A couple of things I just want to note before I close, and then again, I'm happy to talk more about some of the programmatic work maybe in the questions. I thought it was very interesting talking about the importance of networking and exchanges and learning from each other. And I think that's true around the world and certainly true regionally um, in this region, important for, for people to really learn from, from others who have faced similar issues and, and come from perhaps more similar situations, more similar contexts than, um, than maybe uh, you know, another region in the world. I mean, one of the most interesting and I think important things that the State Department does is really try to facilitate both networks in countries to try to uh, bring people here for visitor exchange programs to really help uh, people learn from each other in a very real uh, sort of person-to-person -person way uh, whether it's because they come to the United States to learn about programs that we have or the kind of work we do or they learn from each other um, in regional exchanges 
and I think there's some very, you know, exciting things that come out of that when you see a program in one part of the world kind of get transferred to another part of the world because people really see that despite their differences there are often similarities and things they can take from each other and that they can use those those platforms of exchanges that are sponsored by the US government or other donor uh, other countries who are donors and have this type of programming uh, we can really help provide that space for those kind of exchanges of information so that women um, can learn from each other about what has worked uh, to break through barriers to political participation, to address gender-based violence, to create uh, a more enabling environment for economic empowerment. So I think uh, that's an important thing to talk about in terms of how to ensure that uh, the, these networks of women uh, who are interested in politics, in public life, in policy advocacy can really uh, learn from each other across the region and around uh, the globe. So I'll end with that, um, but to say that the issues of women's political participation in this region and others are very centrally important uh, to the work that we do at the State Department and the Global Women's Issues Office, and we continue to focus on it every day. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity, and thank you all for coming to hear this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. I mean, um, for many years we have uh, watched how effective uh, the activities of the State Department in funding and promoting women's rights in the region was, and especially, I mean, under Secretary Clinton, she made a point of even always pushing them. So, um, and even for someone like myself, whenever I travel to the region, I'm always, I admire this networking. And just if I share with you a personal experience, um, uh, when I was um, in 2007, when I was uh, imprisoned in Iran and uh, put, uh, in solitary confinement, my jailer, my interrogator were stunned by the sheer number of women from the region. You know, they thought that a group of Western women will sign a petition for me, but when they thought the literally the hundreds and the thousands of Arab women, Muslim women in the region signing a petition, and even the uh, Free Hale movement started by an Iraqi-American woman. You know, so that really networking, I think, is something that we uh, care a lot. Now, to a serious question to all of you. My sense has been, as someone who has been involved with women's issues for many decades, that the impediment for the women's participation, be it political and economic and so on, has been the existing family laws in each of the personal status law in each of these countries. Is your sense that the younger generation with whom Mariam you have talked to and uh, Shirin you have also talked to, Stephanie you have come across, do, are they aware of the impediments that the personal status law puts in their uh, sort of paths in their way or have they gone beyond this? Who wants to take Shirin? <laughs> Maria? Uh, <laughs> it's called Tarof. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think that the personal status laws are problematic um, to a lot of young people, but not just because of uh, the restrictions they, p they place on gender, although that is very important. I think, uh, and in fact, in Egypt, there was a, a movement, and I don't know actually if it's, if it's continued, but before July 3rd, there was a movement in Egypt to actually have the religious affiliation removed from identity cards. The, the problem a lot of people have with these personal status laws, for example, in places like Egypt, is that they allow for religious institutions to be very much embedded in, within governments. And so um, I think that they're generally very problematic. Uh, I have not seen a lot of um, mobilization um, among women in terms of um, eliminating the role of religion 
in, in the legal rights that are afforded to them under the personal status laws. Although I would say that, without a doubt, religion is obviously a very important factor in how uh, women and young people in the region understand women's rights. And so I think it would be impossible for uh, for the discussion to happen in a productive way without addressing that on some level. I just haven't seen as much of it. Um, what can I say? I'm trying to recall whether or not in any of our conversations with the young men and women we spoke to as part of this research, anybody brought up the issue of the personal status laws. And it, it's really quite, uh, you know, straightforward. Many of uh, our young men and women are probably haven't sort of interacted with the sort of the legal f frame or frameworks that they that they that exist in their country in their countries. So so none of them that we spoke to really said, you know, I'm um, I'm challenged because the personal status law sort of is 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 holding me back. What they what they do talk about are, are more the culture is, is more issues of culture and the norms that they grew up with and their understanding of what the role of women in society is and not just in their families but in society is at large. So I think the big the biggest impediment that I have yeah. seen is that is that that very traditional uh, and very entrenched understanding of, of what the role of women in society is and how and where the space and what the boundaries are for women to participate, rather than the laws and the frameworks themselves. It was, it's more about how they have been, have been raised to think about their role and their uh, contribution to society. And this is all you know, being discussed today, which is great. And this is the opportunity for them to really, for us all to really start sort of um, uh, challenging some of the legal and the, the legal frameworks. But it's, it's also, it's also very much about the household and what social and traditional norms have been sort of entrenched. Next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, one more question, and then we'll open uh, the floor. Uh, we have some 20 people in the overflow, and I have two questions. Um, is your uh, sense that uh, women find it easier to take part in economic activities rather than uh, political activities because the economic world is much more hospitable and less restrictive for them? Hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's easier. I, I think there are different barriers, certainly economic in inclusion and economic participation uh, is limited for women often because of their lack of access to capital, their lack of access, ability to have uh, collateral to own land, for example, that can be used as collateral for loans, uh, maybe some lack of, you know, capacity and skills. Um, but there certainly are a lot of women who participate in the economic sphere, and I think they're very interrelated. Um, one thing that uh, that the U.S. is doing right now that I think is of interest in this sphere is there's something called the Equal Futures Partnership that um, the U.S. started uh, really a couple of years ago with about, at that time, about, I think about 10 countries. It's now grown to 23 or 24. And the idea is that, that countries uh, sign up to become Equal Futures Partners and agree to take actions to uh, revise their legal frameworks around issues of economic and political participation, uh, removing barriers to economic and political participation for women. Um, Jordan and Morocco are members of Equal Futures uh, in this sort of part of the world. Uh, there are members around the globe, and we're hoping the number of those countries increases. But I think the interesting point is that, you know, countries are, are committing to look at barriers and, and see where the legal barriers actually exist and where they can be taken away uh, so that it's easier for women to participate. So I think there are barriers, different kinds of barriers. I think they're interrelated. Mm -hmm. I do think if you look at the gender gap report in the World Economic Forum, however, I mean, I think when you look at how women are doing, there's 
more parity in the economic sphere than in the political sphere. Um, so uh, that that's what the gender gap report shows. I think that many in many countries you feel that when you're in a country. Um, but I think there are barriers to both, and they're really very interlinked um, as well. But it's certainly true that the report shows that that political participation has the lowest uh, parity. Do you want to add something? No, I'm, I'm just oh, here for yes. Maddie. I mean, I don't have much to add other than to say that, you know, obviously the economic situation in the region is almost as terrible as the political situation. And so women definitely face challenges in that sphere, as do men. Um, that being said, their participation has always been lower, um, but at the same time, relatively speaking, better than where it was, say, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and I think also in answering that question, it's important to think about what we mean by political participation or political activity, if we're looking at, you know, representatives in parliament, then yet, without a doubt, their levels of economic participation are way higher than their levels of political participation. But if we're looking at the opportunities for women to be politically active, I actually think right now, given, given the terrible state of the economy, there are actually more opportunities for them to, for example, talk, set up, or establish, participate in some of these grassroots organizations than there are necessarily jobs for them to have. Oh, I was yeah. just, uh, when, I, when you asked the question, I was actually thinking about a woman uh, that uh, we, s we spoke to um, in the Palestinian territories, and when we talked, we asked that question, she said to me, you know, it depends on really how you define, um, you know, political participation. Every uh, participation, everything I do is political, mm -hmm. whether it's in the economic sphere or in the social sphere or in you know, in even in, the, in engaging in a, 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 commi a committee or a group in my, in my, um, in my uh, uh, village. So, so for a lot of women, you know, uh, there is a sense that, you know, they are politically engaged regardless of whether it's in the economic sphere or in the uh, social sphere. You have the floor. Questions? Uh, yes, please. Can you wait for the mic? It's coming, yeah, and uh, please identify yourself. So we move from the left side to the right side and then we shift. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tamir Mahmoud. I'm an attorney in Washington, D.C., and also a member of the Public International Law and Policy Group. And my question is, and it, it, it piggybacks on the last point you were talking about, about women's economic participation. Um, in, and I'm going to talk about Egypt in particular because this is what I know about. There is uh, uh, there's definitely more... Uh, there are a lot of women who are in the workforce, and there are a lot of families that are that rely on the woman as the primary breadwinner for the family. Yet, this is not necessarily the perception in the public sphere. I was talking to one member of the Constituent Assembly uh, last year, who's from the Muslim Brotherhood, and we we're talking about the concept of gender equality. And he mentioned, uh, he said, "I don't know." what you're talking about, this is just our culture. In our culture, the man works and the woman stays at home. <laughs> we do not want this equality. Those were the days you should have to. Exactly, and <laughs> this, this is exactly what I told him, but my, my question is, um, d are there any efforts among these organizations r to actually highlight women's economic power to be able to kind of remind and raise this in the public consciousness. So in, in your discussions across the region or with some of the organizations, have you have you seen any of this? Thank you. Well, I just want to say, um, Tamar, thank you for your question. I'm not sure whether you, you started by saying whether that women's contribution to the uh, to the labor force was, was very strong in our region. Was that what you were saying? Okay, well, I mean, I, I decided to sort of pull up the statistic. At a regional level, women make up 26% of the labor, for, labor force in our region, which is not very high. Uh, um, but when you think about uh, the informal sector, for example, women's contribution is significantly high, and it's unfortunately under, um, what, underappreciated or... Uh, uh, gone, gone unnoticed, really. So, so, um, so first of all, one of the things we need to say is that there is going to be need to be a, a, a much greater effort at ensuring a greater and equal opportunity for women to be within the formal labor 
force in our in our region, and that that includes things like building women's capacity, uh, um, uh, ensuring um, equal uh, uh, equitable sort of uh, um, equal opportunity for women to enter into positions, uh, senior senior positions in in certain institutions, etc. But it also includes things like ensuring that women's uh, women who work in the informal sector are recognized for the contribution that they make. You know, our, our countries, Egypt for one, you know, is largely an agricultural sector country, agriculture based. And so we need to figure out a way of how we can acknowledge and uh, the contribution and make sure that it is, you know, well uh, estimated in a way that um, reflects women's contribution to the economic sphere. But so far we haven't, we haven't done that. And we're not making much of an effort to do that. So I would just add to that that uh, women, uh, you know, as I mentioned, have very high rates of secondary and higher education. I mean, some of the highest rates in the world in the Middle East. And so you have this very educated population that doesn't necessarily have the same kinds of economic opportunities. And so what you're seeing is not just the informal sector explosion, but also um, a, uh, a wave of uh, women entrepreneurs. So talking about technology startups in the region has become very fashionable, um, but it is something that has grown a lot since the Arab Spring started. There are a lot of incubators around the region that support um, young entrepreneurs, and quite a few of these entrepreneurs that are starting these companies are women. And so these incubators are very much... A, you, trying to highlight the work that these women are oh, these women are doing for a variety of different reasons, um, so you see that sort of support coming in. Um, you also see, in fact, some of these the the startups that are being founded in the region are, for example, trying to help in a way formalize the informal sector. There is a well, the freelancing sector, if you will. There is a platform called Nabesh, which is based out of Dubai, I think. And it's about sort of giving opportunity, helping freelancers find opportunities. And the highest levels of participation are among young people and among women. So there are efforts that are happening inside the region, but they're, they're, they're nascent. Yes, in the back, please. And then we move to this. I'm afraid you need to speak a little bit louder. Yeah. Maybe the mic is not working. We can't hear you uh, in the front. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Jim Byrne. I'm a uh, longtime journalist here. Uh, I was present uh, the last uh, 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 July, I think, when uh, Mr. Shaw, uh, the head of USAID, announced a, um, uh, in a very euphoric atmosphere um, a major program aimed at funding women in Afghanistan to do many of these things you're talking about. But I have since heard that program strongly criticized because it basically um, uh, only invited very large organizations to apply for the funding. And I'm wondering uh, uh, what's the status of that from the point of view of the State Department? I'm sure you're quite involved. Um, I think you're talking about the PROMOTE program, um, and uh, which actually we are not <laughs> – I mean, I'm familiar with the PROMOTE program because I worked in Afghanistan, but it is a USAID program focused on building uh, women's leadership economically, politically, and, and sort of in general in Afghanistan. I'm not that familiar with where they are in the procurement and contracting process, but it, uh, just for background. Um, it is a very large amount of money that is going to be uh, invested in women in Afghanistan to try to ensure that the gains that women have made there over the last, uh, since the fall of the Taliban, um, are that women have the capacity to help continue to build out institutions and, and personal capacity as well uh, in terms of uh, their rights and responsibilities and roles in, in Afghanistan. I unfortunately don't work on that program. so. Um, but I, you know, I know about it again from my experience in Afghanistan. I think it's still in the process of uh, USAID, um, you know, putting it out to bid for contracts and things like that. Um, yes, please. 
안돼 Um, thank you. <laughs> First of all, it was an exciting presentation. Thank you so much. We learned a lot. Good thing is things are happening. My, my name is Habib Khan. I worked with USAID. I'm now working with VID. My question is, what mechanism, if any, exists in the Arab Spring movement where people who, are, who were ignored in the past, they are in the rural area, they represent minorities, they represent disabilities, how do you encourage them to participate in this exciting activities in financial area or in political participation or in peace building or in conflict resolution? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take another question from the lady here. We take two questions because just so. Yes. Uh, my name is Virginia Austin Schubert and I'm involved with the International Youth Foundation. I have three questions. First of all, <laughs> where are the other women in the room, and why aren't they standing up asking questions? <laughs> <laughs> My second question is, to what degree do you women believe that women leaders like Benazir Bhutto, Margaret Thra Thatcher, Anyan Su Shi, Queen Rania, or even here in the United States, the potential of our having a woman leader before too many years make a difference in helping inspire women to stand up and participate. Thank you. And my third question is. You're running out of time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, to what extent is USAID and the State Department? turning its attention to some of our male leaders in this country and trying to help them get more on the page with women's issues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you uh, Stephanie, sure. you uh, let, me, let me just start off by, by saying, and those are a lot of questions, so I'll just say a few things uh, about, about that. Um, I mean, our, in terms of the the role of, of my office and I think the commitment of um, the State Department's leadership is to really continually, both within U.S. foreign policy mechanisms and outside, to talk about the importance of women, to talk about the importance of women's leadership in every sphere, and to really spotlight and highlight what's going on with women around the world. Um, that's a really important thing that we can do. Um, and we can do that uh, in every region of the world because we, we are everywhere, and that's, I think, something very, very important. We can highlight where there are things that are very problematic, and we can highlight success stories. Um, I, I will say this. I think we have gotten phenomenal support from men and women um, within the U.S. government um, in countries in which we work. Um, and we, obviously our role is to highlight the work around, um, you know, women, but we also understand that uh, men and boys are important to this work as well. And so I think we have been able to engage at that level. And I will say we've gotten really support from men and women around the world, around this, in, in the U.S. and uh, from, it's a very bipartisan, I think, topic. Um, we have a lot of support from people across the political spectrum. So I think that's a very exciting thing about working on these issues. Um, people are very interested in this issue and people want to support women's political, economic uh, participation around the globe. And so I think that's very, it's very, um, it gives you, you know, it makes it great to go to work every day, actually. Maria, you want to uh, I'll very briefly try to answer two of the questions. Um, the first question uh, from the gentleman about marginalized people and how we reach them. Um, a lot of the groups uh, that have been created since the start of the Arab Spring, these sort of informal groups, have, are themselves doing the outreach. So they, through the process of doing, have learned. So for example, there's an Egyptian group called Mosedin that does a lot of videos. And after about a year and a half of doing those videos, they learned how to make videos. And so they started actually going out into other parts of Egypt and holding trainings. 
with people all over the country. Um, there are several examples like that. So there's nothing I can speak to that's institutionalized yet, but these groups themselves, many of whom are urban, recognize that in order to actually spread this sort of phenomenon, they need to reach out. So they're doing it themselves. The other uh, point about women leaders, um, I think women women leaders, and I, I don't know how to, women leaders, I, I can't define what that word is at this point, but women have been very inspirational um, in the Arab Spring. And I think the best, the most um, powerful example is a, is a 26-year-old at the time named Asma Mahfouz, who's Egyptian, who put out a call on YouTube um, before January 25th, a very profound call on YouTube, calling upon her fellow Egyptians, and in particular men, to come down on January 25th and support her because she was going to go down on January 25th. And I, and this, by all accounts, inspired a lot of people to go down on that day. So I would check out that video because I think that is one extremely powerful example of how women are very powerful. And of course there are others, but that was the, that's the one I would point to. Um, thank you for the question around how we're including um, um, citizens from um, remote parts of uh, our countries and the region, um, and also those who have sort of not been fully engaged and who are less uh, or more disadvantaged. Uh, I just wanted to probably mention a program that CARE has. This is not sort of advertising for CARE. But it just came to mind, so I'm going to mention it. We have a, a, a program that's currently being implemented in eight countries in our region. It's called the Arab Network for Social Accountability. It's a network of um, uh, that's sort of uh, the, of organizations that uh, come together across the region in the countries where we operate to encourage young men and women from you know remote parts of the country those who are affiliated to you know community structures or those who aren't those who have access to internet and those who don't and the basic sort of um, the basic uh, objective is really to ensure that some of these men and women can be in spaces where they can themselves develop tools for holding government accountable for the services that are provided um, so really the network, the, the role of the network is just to facilitate the dialogue around, uh, uh, facilitate dialogue around, uh, uh, amongst these different actors and groups to help them in developing the tools and then to have them themselves use those tools to hold, you know, duty bearers accountable. It's very interesting in that there's it's up to young men and women to decide what it is they'd like to address as an issue, but it is up to them to also develop the tools that they will be using. And it is a great way to bring young men and women together and people who don't often come together because of these geographic or age or um, uh, class divides come together and the purpose is facilitation, tools development, and engaging them in becoming responsible citizens. And I think this is what I was trying to say about uh, opportunities for those who are emerging in the re region as you know drivers of change to find a appropriate channels. If some of the big P political channels are being are closing, there are other channels where young men and women can certainly engage. Uh, and uh, the Arab Network for Social Accountability is one. Um, on women being, uh, you know, uh, can they make a difference? You know, I, I believe that to be true. I wish people would spot, uh, stop spotlighting what, wi what women leaders wear and what their dress is all about, <laughs> and then we can get to the, the real issues. Um, you know, I come from Egypt, so I, you know, I, I, I grew up in a culture that celebrates Queen Hatshepsut, the first king of Egypt. And I grew in a culture where, you know, Cleopatra, beautiful as she was, but she, you know, quite powerful and moved nations. So uh, this is not, this is not extraordinary for, for, uh, for the the region. But the fact of the matter is, and again, I'm going to go back to the statistics. In 2012, there was a poll that was conducted, and uh, around whether. Uh, uh, men and women would welcome a woman president into the presidency, and the results were 18% of our own people, men and women, do not welcome or see women within leadership roles. Uh -huh. And I think it's, it's, 
that's that's the that for me is the is the is the issue. It's not so much whether I believe that when women can make a difference. I do believe that to be true because, you know, I come from that uh, conviction. But I, I part of the part of the issue is that the larger segment of our populations don't, and we are going to need to show uh, you know really uh, give rise to the role models, not spotlight what they're wearing, but give rise to those. Uh, the 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 w women who are the positive role mo models in our society. You mentioned Queen Rania as being one. We're not. We're going to need to not talk about what she wears, but what she does. She speaks about education very, very forcefully. Why is this not what we focus on when we talk about women in our region? So absolutely, they make a difference. But uh, let's let's uh, surface those role models and keep talking about them positively. Actually, the global women leadership initiative at the Wilson Center uh, has a program of 50-50 uh, reaching out uh, to women around the world and to governments to make sure that uh, there would be 50 percent presentation of women in their public policy decision making so that w everybody no matter where you go is working on it and we are working very closely with the Department of uh, State on this issue. Let me take uh, the last question from the overflow and I think this is a question that all three may want to address. It, it said that you know liberation women, uh, movements include women when during in their war um, revolutions welcome women but once the revolution is over once the war is the the war for liberation is over women are marginalized and sent home an example was the algerian war of revolution the liberation, women were very active, but once it was over, they were just packed and sent home. Um, during the Iranian revolution, women were participating in the street, but uh, after the revolution, every time you brought up the question of women's rights, they said, let us deal with other issues and then we'll get to that. And you know, women have been waiting more or less 35 years to wait to that. So the question is to the panel, how can women break this cycle and what has changed since 2011 when the Arab Spring started? Who wants to start? Mariam, Yola. That's a big question. <laughs> okay, if I can solve this question, then <laughs> I can do anything. So um, yeah, that's obviously a very, uh, very accurate description of how things have worked. What can women do to break that cycle, though, and how are things different? I mean, obviously, it, it's, it's happened again. I mean, and again, when I say it's happened again, I'm talking about political participation in a very specific way. I'm talking about political participation really at that, you know, within government. Um, the in Egypt after right after Mubarak was ousted there was a, uh, a gathering there was a group that was put together to uh, to uh, help draft a constitutional I think it was amendments something yeah. like that the March 20 the yeah March 2011 and there were no women uh, uh, in that group um, the uh, group the committee of 50 which was put together, which was hand-selected um, to draft the now new constitution of Egypt had five women out of 50. So this is a recurring problem. Um, but as I, as I mentioned before, there is so much now happening at the grassroots level. And I really think that that's where ultimately women are, the way women are going to make gains at the government level. So women's involvement has continued on that level very substantially um, in a variety of different groups. And they are making alliances with uh, the men that are in these groups as well. Oftentimes, the women have established the groups and the men have joined the groups. I think that these experiences are shifting those social and cultural norms very, very, very slowly, but they are shifting them. And ultimately, more, even more so than um, quotas and constitutions or laws that uh, you know formally legalize equality, it's going to be those shifts 
at the cultural and social level that Janine has spoken about and that many have spoken about that are really going to matter the most towards ensuring that what's happened in the past doesn't get repeated again. And to the extent that that is happening, and I think that it is, um, I'm hopeful. But these processes are very slow processes, um, and they do need to be complemented by legal efforts. How do we break the cycle? <laughs> well, I, um, I've heard this, uh, the term used to describe uh, um, this problem as being called a democratic paradox, which is you know, women being part of that change process and then being sidelined once you know, talk of democracy starts happening. So it is quite a paradox, women being sidelined just because we, we start to, um, to, um, to, pu to push and demand for democracy. I mean, the two things for me is that women need to keep the pressure, women need to keep the pressure up and unite. Um, that's what I'm, you know, I've been trying to, I try to sort of say, this fragmentation within the women's movement, within the different activist groups and networks is problematic coming together to dialogue, to have conversations, to find common ground, and to seek opportunity. One of the opportunities that's coming up is, as an example, you know, the, um, the Egyptian constitution that was just passed, 98% out of a 36% eligible voting uh, population in Egypt. Article 11 talks about reasonable representation of women in the uh, uh, highest uh, levels of government in Egypt. Now is the opportunity to determine and to define and to demand uh, that women claim and women decide what reasonable representation actually means. We may have lost the sort of the, the battle for a quota in part, but you, we still have an opportunity to define what that means. There are opportunities. Unite keep the pressure up and seize on, seize on the opportunities that are opening up because they are many. Um, I would just say, uh, in part also to go back to the last question about the role of women leaders, um, I think women leaders make a difference. I think we see women leaders around the globe at a lot of different levels and not just in elected office. So I, I really take that point about what is, what, who are women political leaders. They aren't necessarily just the people elected, though. I think that's very important and, and because those are the bodies where decisions are made. So I think, you know, they, women need to get there. But I also think uh, women leaders at every level of, of elected office or, or appointed office make a huge difference. And um, they can change um, the face of politics in a very real way that can encourage other people um, and, and change the norms around who, who leads us. Um, and who we, we see as our leaders. So I think that's very important, and women can play a huge role in um, breaking down the stereotypes of, of who a leader is. Um, I would agree, I think, you know, from what the other, from what you said about um, it's important to keep the pressure on internally to a country, we would say that here, certainly, uh, to really pressure for any kind of reform. Um, I think, you know, one thing is also to look at um, how women, looking for women, uh, women looking for allies in, in sectors that may not be what you normally think of, if it's the economic sector, you know, how to bring new people into this kind of um, advocacy setting to pressure for women, fuller participation, um, and really trying to take advantage of the women who are already active in a place. And, and try to, maybe not in politics or maybe not in the public sphere in the way we traditionally think of it, but maybe they're business owners or they're very active in, in um, other kinds of organizations that aren't traditionally in the political sphere, social services, how to bring those women into and try to break the cycle uh, of, of women having a lack of, of um, as, not having as much space as men to participate. But certainly, um, really just to reinforce, I think very important that women be part of the process at every level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking with, uh, our panelists with a big applause. Um, we started our meeting 10 minutes late, so we covered the full hour and a half. You see how fair women are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Please join us for a reception. Uh, I think my colleagues will show you.